Okay, now, oh, thank God. Okay, we're in business. We are in business. Wait, Scott, I have to get back to the other menu. Just press menu and go back out. Oh, okay, okay, um, okay. I think we're in business, like, oh my God. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Scott, thank you, Ed. Uh, okay, call me back. Okay, thank you. Wow, um, if anyone can see me on YouTube now, um, this is the first time I'm trying to stream on YouTube, but we've been, I'm here coming to you from my home studio, and um, I have invested in a lot of equipment. Um, one of them is a Sling Studio. You can see I'm kind of monitoring this stream, and it's quite complicated so I mean it's actually quite simple but when things don't work go try to figure out what's wrong anyway welcome I hope that um, the Northbrook Public Library patrons have um, already received the private links to my um, uh, my video pre-recorded video performances um, you should have received the performance of the pathetique sonata and also the Waldstein Sonata. And the Opus 22, um, I have queued up. I don't know if it'll go out because I don't know if I have enough resolution um, here. Uh, but I thought today would be really kind of neat if it was a combination. So um, I was given the opportunity by the Northbrook Library to provide you with some pre-recorded videos and also the option to try to go live. Um, so uh, what I would like to do is actually do a little lecture that I've prepared, and it's based on a rather long thesis that I wrote on Beethoven's Waldstein Sonata when I was a student and undergraduate at Yale. And um, I've, I just would like to introduce each of the sonatas that I'm presenting today in celebration of Beethoven's 250th birthday. Um, this month, he was, they, nobody actually knows, it's a big mystery, what day was Beethoven born on? We only know what day he was baptized on, and that was the 17th. And we know that he was born in Bonn, and that typically uh, babies were baptized the day after their birthday. So it's generally presumed that he was born on December 16th. But since we don't know for sure, we're celebrating his birthday all year long, and especially this month. Um, Anyway, uh, what I'll do is I'll just, I'm going to read for you um, what I've prepared. Um, it's not memorized, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, in doing this, I will also supplement with some live performance of excerpts of the sonatas. And I might surprise you with one other movement of a sonata. I don't know which yet. Um, if this were interactive, I could certainly take some requests. Um, what I can say is that if the um, music librarian, Madison Carroll, is watching and she cares to text me any comments um, and requests, um, then I will try to accommodate at the end of my presentation. Um, and the other last thing that I want to say is that this will be fairly short because I'd love to direct you all to go to in.live to purchase the live stream, um, the third live stream broadcast of my performance of Beethoven's Piano Concerto Number no. 2 with the Northbrook Symphony Orchestra and Mina Zikri um, conducting. And we pre-recorded this performance at Ovation in Chicago, a beautiful event space, and we did it on October 27th, Tuesday, October 27th. And so um, the orchestra came together. We were all socially distanced, um, six feet or more between each player and the next one, and um, we all had to wear masks, including myself. And so um, the, today is the last day of the broadcast, but the broadcasts are archived, so if you purchase one, you can watch it at your leisure at a time that's more convenient for you within 72 hours. Anyway, um, this is what I'd like to talk to you about. I'm just gonna go through um, most of you Almost everybody knows about Beethoven. Um, we know the, the story of the young composer who was a prodigy pianist, who was nurtured by his own father, and many, many um, musicians um, 
So it, it comes as no surprise that pianists, since Beethoven was a pianist and he wrote amazing things for piano, that pianists have embraced him uh, in, in such a way. He wrote 32 sonatas for piano, and um, whereas Bach, jo Johann Sebastian Bach, his um, well-tempered clavier was, is considered, or was named by one prominent musician, the Old Testament in music. Uh, Beethoven's 32 piano sonatas is called the New Testament. It's that substantial a body of work. Anyway, let me um, read to you um, so uh, this presentation that I have, because it will at least ensure that I cover everything. And, um, and then I'll do some demonstrations along the way um, once we get into a little bit more of an analysis of the pieces that I've prepared for the Northbrook Public Library. OK. In 1792, an ambitious young composer and pianist left his home city of Bonn on the Rhine to go to Vienna, then the musical capital of the world. Haydn had stopped in Bonn on his way to London in December of 1790, and upon hearing Beethoven's piano performance in some of his compositions, agreed to accept him as a student. One of the most influential supporters of Beethoven at this time who encouraged this move was a close friend and patron of Beethoven's, Count Waldstein. And that is why the Opus 53 Sonata is named the Waldstein Sonata because it was dedicated to this particular patron. Um, he wrote to Beethoven the following letter upon his departure for Vienna. Dear Beethoven, you are going to Vienna in fulfillment of your long frustrated wishes. The genius of Mozart is mourning and weeping over the death of her pupil. She found a refuge but no occupation with the inexhaustible Haydn. Through him, she wishes to form a union with another. With the help of assiduous labor, you shall receive Mozart's spirit from Haydn's hands. Your true friend, Waldstein. So isn't that a, that's one of my favorite quotes um, from a letter that was written to, Be to Beethoven. And, you know, it really, it, it's quite extraordinary to even, at that time, Haydn was, was described as inexhaustible. Well, he wrote over 100 symphonies, so he was truly inexhaustible. But even though Beethoven only wrote nine symphonies, um, we have to still say, I, I would say that Beethoven was pretty inexhaustible too, and, and prodigious and prolific. Um, so Beethoven's music, musical contribution to the world is inestimable. His works do include the nine symphonies I just mentioned, 32 piano sonatas, numerous sonatas, five of them for cello and piano, 10 of the 10 sonatas for violin and piano, of which I've recorded all 10 for WFMT, um, five piano concerti, which you will be able to hear one of them performed by me, recorded with the NSO today, if you so choose. Um, only one violin concerto, unfortunately. But he did write a triple concerto, which I've also performed, which has very prominent uh, violin, and some people say it's more of a concerto for cello with violin and piano accompaniments, but um, it, it is a very distinctive part for the piano, uh, for the violin, I mean, um, and for all three instruments, really. Um, 11 overtures, 15 string quartets, nine piano trios, an oratorio, an opera, two masses, and a host of smaller works. So Haydn may have been inexhaustible with his numerous string quartets and symphonies and piano trios and everything, but I think Beethoven surpassed him. Um, Fortunately for Beethoven, unlike Schubert, who died in a pauper's grave, Beethoven was recognized in his lifetime. He was a n nothing less than a celebrity. And uh, he probably took advantage of that a little bit and um, had a reputation for being somewhat surly and boorish and, and very emotional. Um, and we can hear that in his music. Um, so. Beethoven's life is divided into three periods, but rather than dividing, it's better to think of them as sort of as an, on a continuum. And today, what you will have heard, um, what I prepared of the three sonatas, um, they, it spans from one of his earlier sonatas, um, published in 1798, the Opus 13, the Pathetique, 
and um, goes up as far as his middle period, the Opus 53, with the Waldstein Sonata. And in between, the one sonata that hasn't been posted, which I will try to run through this link studio and air for you live um, through YouTube now, is the Opus 22, the Grand Sonata in B-flat. So um, a little bit about what these three periods, what they are in general, and, and generally this is very, very common knowledge, but just to go over it, um, the scholar Vincent de Andi called them periods of imitation for the first, then externalization, and then the third one, reflection. And why do you think he termed those? Um, well, very, it's very simple. The first period, which runs through about 1802, was a period of imitation where many of his early pieces were very Mozartian. So when you hear his Beethoven Piano Concerto, Opus 19, which I performed and which is streaming today, you'll hear a very Mozartian uh, texture and style of piano writing and orchestral writing. Um, this is a far cry from his middle period where he started to expand the size of his works and the middle period sonatas, for example, are exemplified by the Waldstein and the Opus 57 Appassionata um, and the Hammerklavier. So um, these are huge monumental pieces. And so as he matured as an artist, he started expanding the traditional classical forms as we knew them from Mozart and Haydn. Um, so uh, the main thing that I'd like to talk to you about today is the sonata form. And the sonata form basically was, um, came about as a, as a binary form and it was uh, very much a result of the establishment of regular public concerts. And with that, um, the, the emphasis went more to instrumental music as opposed to sacred and vocal music that was more prevalent in churches. Um, so up until that time, also instrumental music had more of a ceremonial or court function. Um, hence, there were a, you know predominance of dances and things. A sonata form enabled much greater development of ideas, of themes and motifs. So um, what I would like to say about um, that is also that the sonatas were typically, but not exclusively, were um, originally written to be performed by amateurs, not necessarily professionals. Um, and then as they became more, um, complex as he developed as a composer, um, he started writing more as uh, the sonatas as vehicles for his own virtuosic self-expression. And being a virtuoso that he is, um, almost without exception, um, his sonatas are extremely virtuosic. So I would love to now um, talk about the three sonatas and um, I think I'll just uh, open up my music for you and um, talk about the pathetique. Hold on, let me grab my, my music here. Um, give me a moment. It was not, here we go. Okay. So the, the sonata that um, many of you might have already accessed on the private link, which was shared, the pathetique, this sonata, was not named path pathetique by Beethoven. His publisher put that name to it because he felt it expressed a certain amount of pathos and solemnity. And um, Beethoven actually liked the title. So there, sometimes he would provide the title of his sonatas, but mostly not. And um, it does appear that many of his uh, sonatas have been given names, um, you know, like the Tempest, like the Appassionata, um, the Les Adieu, Opus 81A. So um, these pieces are, uh, had the, the, the reason for them, uh, the names are, usually they're very uh, ap applicable. They, the, and in this case, the pathetique I selected so that we could all experience and reflect upon 
um, not experience, we all are experience a great deal of suffering and pathos under a global event, a worldwide pandemic, which is having uh, a profound effect on people's, on humanity around the world. And so this sonata, I think, really hits home with that. Um, and one of the things that I love about it is that this is one of the first sonatas that um, Beethoven was, um, he was able to somehow connect the three s movements of this sonata. And there's certain thematic elements in it um, that connect. And in that way, makes the sonata not just three separate movements, but more of a whole. And um, in the performance that I've shared with you, um, many of you aficionados might notice that the exposition, when I did the repeat, um, for the first time ever, I decided to go back um, to the very, very beginning where it opens with grave and repeat back to there, even though that's not what, what, what is marked in my score. And um, the reason for that is just because I was doing a little research and discovered that um, there are several pianists, prominent pianists out there that um, were suggesting that that might be a better way to illustrate how this introduction, this grave, is really more of a part of the sonata form in that it is a first theme by itself. So um, one of the things that is very apparent in this grave opening is this dotted rhythm. And this is a little bit of a holdover from this court um, French style um, of, of dotted rhythms, like the French overture. So I'll play a little bit of that so you can hear um, that dotted rhythm and understand what I'm referring to. The next beautiful melody is becomes much more lyrical, but it doesn't get rid of that dotted rhythm. And here is where you see the lyricism that Beethoven was very famous for. Unlike Mozart, who had like a very pearly, detached, very um, a, a very distinctive sound with his playing. Beethoven was noted and described as having a very legato and singing um, sound, which I always found very interesting because um, Beethoven was not like uh, an opera composer like Mozart was. And I always felt, um, you know, growing up and studying Beethoven from being a young child, I always felt of Beethoven as being more motivically and rhythmically driven than lyrically driven. Um, and it, it, upon further and further and deeper study of his works, um, one can see that is not, not true at all. Um, and his music contains some of the most lyrical, passionate music um, that we can hear that in in all likelihood was the influence and inspiration behind um, some of the works that Chopin wrote. Um, and you will hear that in the Opus 22 slow movement. It's one of the most beautiful, almost like a nocturne-like uh, slow movement. So anyway, here's the, this very lyrical um, theme continues with these fortissimo outbursts. So from here.
So now you heard where the exposition really takes off. Um, and this is uh, sometimes considered like a rocket theme. It's just like shooting right up to the top. And uh, there's a huge amount of dynamic contrast in this piece. And um, a, a really uh, a lot of virtuosity and hand crossing. And this is so wonderfully captured by Ed Ingold in the video that he put together because he has an overhead camera, he has a front view camera and a side camera. So if you really want to see the close-ups of my hands overhead and, and the hand crossing and all that kind of stuff, you really have to watch that whole video. Um, so in the interest of time, um, I am I don't really want to talk too much about this sonata because there, there won't be time to talk in great depth about each sonata. Um, but I would like to uh, say that what I was referring to before is the, the use of this opening theme, how it comes back at the end of the exposition. It is used again to transition us into the development section. And so, um, as such, I, I want to just describe what does a sonata form really accomplish? Well, basically, you generally have to go from the tonic key of, in this case, C minor, and you have to modulate, usually to a distant key. And in this case, um, the development section go, gets to G minor. this 5-7, or dominant 7th of E minor. So anyway, that same theme, and why it's more than just an introduction, it comes back again in the, a, a coda at the very end. And it's truncated. It's no longer the same. And that's because when Beethoven writes, he is constantly using a variation technique. He never presents the same thing. Even in a rondo form, he's always putting in little nuances and differences so that each time you hear that theme in a rondo, for example, it's a little bit different. And that's what makes it really special. It's the differences, viva la difference, um, that really bring the music alive and keeps the listener's interest. So the last iteration of this grave theme doesn't even start with the chord. It, it ha it's prefaced by this. No chord. So that's the tumultuous conclusion of the first movement of the pathetique. The second movement is quite a special movement. It was used in, um, as a theme song for Carl Haas's Adventures in Music, which was broadcast on, in New York City on, on a national public station, national public radio. Very famous melody, and um, this is uh, structure of this piece involves um, basically like a, a rondo sonata form. It has two episodes. Um, one episode um, called the B episode, and then it has a C episode, so it's A, B, A, C, A, and then a coda. 
and this is um, very choral, very serene and solemn. And my feeling about this piece is that even though it's an A flat major, it has a sense of melancholy, but with hope and with optimism. So um, I'll just play the opening for you. The next theme, that was just the first iteration of the A theme. The next B theme goes like this. can't help from playing it. It's like to play this piece is so divine and um, I, I love teaching it, I love performing it. The second, the C episode, I just want to play it for you before we move on, um, starts like this. Oh, sorry. When you listen to this piece, you'll hear some really great harmonies and things when he gets down. It's like fate kind of coming, knocking at the door there. Um, the interesting and beautiful thing about this is the variation technique that he uses. He introduces the triplet in the very beginning, um, right here. And then when it comes in this theme, the C theme, so we have those triplets that are going through it. So then when he comes back to the theme again, the final time, it's with a triplet variation of, uh, of, on the accompaniment. So there you have that beautiful, just a little introduction um, to teach you about the structure of it and how Beethoven's compositional process of weaving all of these themes and even with Beethoven, the accompaniment becomes motivic, becomes motivically important. And um, we now move on 
And we have, we have the third movement, Rondo. And this is, it's such a great piece. Um, I'm going to have to defer and not talk so much about this last rondo. It's, it's a much lighter movement than the, the first movement, um, but it, it certainly has its Sturm und Drang, which um, you will see. Let me see if I can play you a little part. Um, maybe just the opening. <laughs> So just giving you a little taste, because I did do a whole pre-recorded thing on Tuesday of the whole sonata. And um, the storm and drawing that I was referring to um, was actually here. <laughs> a little bit of what to look forward to when you listen to my performance. Um, it's funny, I feel a little more inspired being live doing this, knowing that people might be out there watching and I'm live, as opposed to recording with nobody watching. <laughs> so, um, one, thing, one other thing that I want to point out is this beautiful theme, ep one of the episodes. <laughs> You can hear this counterpoint, which Beethoven had learned so assiduously from Albrechtsberger and um, so got the belief, and he uh, learned, he studied the works of Bach. And we will see, um, if I continue my lectures on Beethoven with his late sonatas, um, how in his, as he aged and, and matured as a composer, he, the influence of Bach became ever more important. And we see that Bach really had a renaissance in the Romantic era. Mendelssohn was championing uh, and bringing back uh, works of Bach um, because essentially, as Beethoven was a bridge to the Romantic era, both the Romantic 19th century Romanticism and the Baroque era are Romantic uh, are essentially romantic styles. With the Baroque, there's a lot of ornamentation and it, and it is a very um, romantic, whereas the classical style that Beethoven was raised in and started out in was more refined and more controlled and, and uh, uh, of a different kind of elegance and um, aesthetic. So um, the next thing that I'd like to do is I'm wondering I might be able to do this, which would be to um, try to stream the Opus 22 um, Sonata right now. But I think it, rather than that, um, I will uh, talk about the Waldstein Sonata. So um, let me pull out my treatise that I wrote. Um, you know, hmm. Uh, I, I don't even know if I want to uh, go through all of the detail here. Um, I wrote like a 50 page uh, thesis on this one sonata and believe you me, it, I could have written 100 pages on it. Um, but you know what? It's much better to just play it. I think you have to show not tell when you're a performer. Um, so let me take, let's take a look at the Waldstein sonata and try to figure out what is the 
Um, we're skipping right now the Opus 22. The Opus 22 was one of his grand sonatas, and it's in four movements, and there's so much to talk about that sonata. Um, in fact, I will talk about it. I'm just going to sort of skip through in case we run out of time. Um, so the Waldstein Sonata has these, is built on three themes, and it's, um, it, it's really an expansive form. And in fact, it, the first movement and the last movement were so big that Beethoven decided to take the original slow movement out of the piece. And it was labeled as Dante Favori, and it's, it's a standalone piece now. And he replaced it with the current um, introduction. And this introduction is much smaller scale, and, it's, and it segues immediately into the Rondo finale. So um, what is what are some of the distinctive features about this first movement? First of all, there are um, three primary themes. Okay, one is the theme, and there's a lot of thirds in it. So one is going those three notes going up. And then the other um, part of the theme is this. The downward use, use of the downward third in that and, and the downward fifth. So um, going down five notes, we see this expanded in um, the second theme when he has it a chorale melody. And it's the same five notes descending, but much more expanded. OK, so. Um, that's what I wanted to just show you how his mind is working at developing these themes. So the first one, starting pianissimo, this is one of the hardest things for pianists to do, is to play in the base of the piano, repeated chords, and keep them pianissimo. And it's virtually impossible to really keep it pianissimo. So what was Beethoven thinking? Well, certainly, he was playing on a different piano than our modern pianos. And he had four different types of pianos available to him. He had um, a Stein, he had an Arard, he had a Broadwood, and um, uh, what was the other piano he had? Well, it'll come to me. Um, so the pianos that he had, some of them had very unusual types of dampers and pedals and things. But what we do know is that they did not have the power of the modern piano. And this has caused such a um, difficulty for our contemporary performance practice uh, and trying to understand how we should play his sonatas and observe the markings that he put in. Because in this sonata, one of the, um, the most famous pedal markings is in the third movement where he pedals through the tonic and dominant tonic, just pedal, indicates to pedal straight through it. Now, if you do as he asks, it, I think it sounds like uh, just not, not something that, that I truly enjoy listening to. It's kind of a cacophonous mess. Now, um, by this time, of course, his, um, his hearing was already beginning to go. And I think that he also had this concept of sound that was just so much greater, so much greater and so much more resonant and so much more powerful than his pianos could provide. So I imagine that some of his um, pedal markings might have uh, been used to, um, you know, just to create even more sound and a, a, a blending of these harmonies. Um, but I just don't, I don't particularly want it to sound like Debussy. So I do change the pedal. Um, that's a choice that I make. And um, I, I try to let it blur a little bit, but clear it out so that we hear in this opening of the rondo, we hear um, the very distinct tonic and the dominant. So I, I will demonstrate to you what I'm talking about. So clearly he wants you to change the pedal at that 
when you arrive at the, the dominant, but it's within the first phrase that he's actually changing the harmony from tonic to dominant in the accompanimental figure and also so, so one has to make the decision. Do we observe what was written, um, what's in the autograph, what's in the print, the, uh, the um, first editions? Uh, do we adapt it to the modern piano? Um, that all depends on so many different factors. It can depend a little bit on the piano that you're playing on. It can also depend on the hall that you're playing on. I think if you're playing on a, uh, a hall that is is very dry, you might want to use more pedal. If you're playing in a very wet hall, it's all gonna get kind of mushy anyway, but um, you, you know, if it's very wet, then you wanna kind of make it a little bit more clear. Um, I like to change the pedal not so much uh, for the accompaniment figure, but for the melody. Um, so anyway, this is my opening theme of the rondo. And we're gonna, we're gonna, we're kind of jumping around. We're gonna work forwards and backwards with this piece. But anyway, here it is. <laughs> So there you have a little taste of the Beethoven Rondo from the Waldstein. Now, well, what came before this, and this is very interesting, this introduction, this Adagio Molto, here we definitely hear the expansion of tonality and harmony right from the outset. But what we also hear is Beethoven's ability to use ambiguity where there's certain chords which could really go either way. And we hear this in every single movement. I'm not gonna go through and point that all out to you, but let's just listen for a moment to this opening because um, this opening starts out in F. And F major in the first movement, in the first measure, he goes to a D sharp, he introduces a D sharp and tonicizes an E major chord. That's kind of unusual, but why does he do that? Because he uses the E major as a secondary key tonality in the first movement, remember? So he's still kind of connecting the dots here and using this introduction to tie the entire sonata together um, because of certain common elements. So listen to a little bit of this introduction.
So that's technically the recap of the, the original theme that he opens with. And he uses that to create in um, a long, steady uh, pedal point, if you will, well, it kind of moves down, from very exotic harmonies. <laughs> So um, I urge you to watch my entire performance of this. Um, the, going back to the first movement, um, you will note that this theme is heavily used um, not only in the development section, but also in the um, sort of like this concluding section in the recapitulation where he does so he's combining them, and they're really uh, truncated and condensed um, in, you know, basically like stretto form with increasing virtuosity. Um, it, it's really quite an, a brilliant passage, um, which is what, what, one of my favorite parts of the whole sonata. <laughs> going to give it away. Anyway, let's now move on. It's 10 of 4. For those of you who might like to watch the Northbrook Symphony Orchestra live stream, I encourage you to go to in.live or you can go to the nso.org and purchase that live stream. Um, just a couple of words before we conclude um, about the Opus 22. Um, that sonata is not often played, and it's just sometimes it just baffles me uh, because it is a, a magnificent sonata, and it's one that I have recorded on my one of my newest CDs, the Classical Style Two. So if you'd like to purchase that, um, you can find it on my website. You can find it on iTunes and Spotify and Amazon. So that's the Classical Style Two. And um, it's it won many awards, and I'm I'm really love this uh, CD that I put together. That has um, it has a Haydn sonata in G major, a little Haydn sonata. Then it has the Mozart duo sonata. Um, Kirschel 521 in C major for piano duo, which I perform with my husband, Stephen Green. And then it concludes with this Opus 22 sonata. What I love about this is this, the opening. I love both the opening, I love every movement of this piece, and there's four of them. So it, it, they're very, very um, varied in their character. Um, and the first one, uh, my dear late father-in-law used to call this the goody, goody, goody goody gumdrops because that's the rhythm of the opening <laughs>
just giving you a little taste of it. So um, what I think I'm going to just do is just briefly go through each movement get to, to, to give you a taste rather than talk about it so much. Um, the slow movement that I previously mentioned is very Chopin-esque. It has these just very, and, and another thing that it has is this constant undulating repeated eighth note accompaniment in the left hand, a feature that Beethoven seems to love doing these repeated notes. Um, you know, when they're fast, as in here, and also when they're slow, as in here. What comes next, I find, is one of the most extraordinary modulations that he does. It really is beginning, here's where you, you begin to see the extent to which he's beginning to expand tonality and the way that he modulates and makes transitions. Just listen when we get to measure 16 of this piece. I'm going to continue where there was a double bar, and you're going to hear it in just a minute. Right there, absolutely beautiful. When it comes back and he does the same um, modulation, it, it's really quite extraordinary. Similarly, when he's doing this noodling around in the middle, um, he has different um, layers of voices, which I feel in this work make it very similar to his symphonic, his orchestration. And um, I feel that every time Beethoven was writing for the piano, he was writing for uh, an orchestra as well. So when I play a piece, I'm trying to think of those colors and where on the piano, what register it might be, if it's up here in the flutes or a little bit down here in like clarinet or bassoon or the bass, I try to impart that color and think orchestrally. Um, but here's a beautiful interlude where you can hear him sort of noodling around and, and exploring and kind of um, I think it's, it's a beautiful way that he winds back after all of this different modulation um, here, starting very soft.
back to the original theme. We're back to E flat. Isn't that extraordinary the way he is modulating and creating all of this incredibly beautiful and chromatic harmonies, um, even at this early stage in his compositional output of Opus 22? The, let's just moving on. Oh, we're at four o'clock, and I really wanted to keep this under an hour. Um, quickly, the minuet goes like this. <laughs> get a little taste of the minuet, but even more exciting is the minore, which apparently Beethoven encouraged, uh, according to Czerny, to play it a little bit faster. <laughs> Sorry. Giving you just a taste. And then to conclude, I find that this sonata is just one of the most beautiful, relaxing, in a way, melodies. Um, I love it. I love the way he uh, does this rondo and varies it with um, more intense sections, but he always keeps coming back to this really wonderful, um, I, I feel it has a sort of pastoral theme, uh, feeling to it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to say goodbye now. I, those of you who would like to go watch the NSO, go to it. If you miss the beginning, it's going to be archived, so you will have 72 hours to watch it at your leisure. And um, I really enjoyed this time bringing something live to the Northbrook Public Library, which is a venue and a home for me since before 2008. I think I've been playing there um, at least uh, maybe 15 years now, I'm not even sure. But to those of my friends and fans from the Northbrook Public Library, I can't wait to see you in person, um, live at the library again, and I hope you enjoyed what I've produced for you today. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful day. And if you'd like to leave any comments in the YouTube so I can um, see those comments, um, I would love it. Uh, and I'd also like to invite you to join me um, and look for my um, Music with a View concert series, Blue Skies concert series, um, brought to you from Sheridan Music Studio and In.Live, and my talk show program, Merdinger's Musings, which happens almost every week on Tuesdays, and also the Steinway Sundays with Susan and Svetlana. And we have a talk show, which is um, a really wonderful opportunity for those of you who love the piano and love to hear from not just pianists, but also guest musicians. Um, we've had a number of distinguished musicians, composers. We're going to have the pianist Jeffrey Beagle on next Sunday. We're going to have the uh, claimed international award-winning violinist David Yon in here with us on um, Sunday, December 20th, I think it is. Yes, December 20th. Um, hmm, yes, the 20th. And we're, then we have um, additional musicians coming. And um, we're going to have some really interesting discussions with each and every one of them. And you can still um, log in. You can purchase our talk show streams for just $5. And they always last about an hour. So a lot of really interesting and um, fun stuff that we discuss. So if you want to get on the inside track of us professional musicians and hear how we're 
um, doing in this pandemic and how um, our careers are going and um, find out a little bit more inside information about um, what, it, what it is to be a pianist, a violinist, a conductor, a singer. Um, we've got some really interesting things that we're talking about. Uh, also for pedagogues, for teachers, um, we've had a number of sessions on um, technique, memorization, sight reading, um, pedagogical techniques. So uh, I invite you to join um, me and join me and Svetlana Belsky, my studio partner and uh, co-host of Steinway Sundays. Um, just come and, come and see what we're all about. And thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day. And I hope that you enjoy my performances. I am going to try to actually stream the uh, Beethoven Opus 22 directly to this stream. So let me see if I'm able to do that. And if I can't, it will be uploaded and you'll get a link um, through the Northbrook Public Library channels. So, um, oh, okay, let's see. Um, I think that it's not going to play. Um, there's not, it's not compatible because it says the video is 1080 60, 1080p 60, and this output today was 1080 30. So it's not letting me play it. Okay, that's a little problem that I was not aware of. But you will get to see it, I promise. It's ready, um, it's ready to be uploaded to another link where I can, um, I can send you. Thank you to Madison Carroll and the mu Classical Music Librarian at Northbrook Public Library, to Kate Hall, the Executive Director of this wonderful library in Northbrook. And I hope this uh, is enjoyable for everyone um, this Sunday afternoon. Thank you and goodbye.